talk about the purpose of a finance professor. Now, when you immediately see that title, that title may well jar with some of you, right? Talks of this title might seem as preachy and idealistic, so the challenge will be on me to try to make it as concrete and grounded as possible. But let me just explain why I'm going to choose to speak on this topic, right? Normally, when you're invited to give a keynote, you speak about your own research. But I recognise that many of you might just not be interested in my research. You might work in completely different areas. And then when I looked at the highly intimidating list of past keynote speakers that Michelle sent me, I just realised my research is just not as good as some of these people, right? Some of these people have won Nobel Prizes. Many of them have won, have become president of the American Finance Association. I asked myself, well, what do I know that these people don't? The answer is probably nothing. And yet that is probably the only advantage I have is that I'm way less senior than these people. I've only been in the profession for less than 15 years. I've been tenured for less than 10. And when you speak on something like purpose, right, that preaches well from the pulpit when you've won a Nobel Prize and you've been an AFA president, but it might be harder to think about purpose and citizenship when you're still climbing up the ladder. And similarly, right, when you think about purpose and dealing with rejection, I believe that at least one person on this list has never had a paper rejected. I get rejected all the time, so a lot of the things I'm saying here, I'm trying to say to myself as much as to anybody else, these are real things that I struggle with, and these, this is why I've chosen to talk about this in my talk of today. So I think a good place to start is to think about, well, what is purpose? And this is something that my academic research is increasingly about. And so what I'm looking at in that research is what does it mean for a company to be purposeful? And so there's two defining characteristics. The first is a company's purpose has to be intrinsic rather than instrumental. It's about serving wider society rather than making money. But the second point is also important, is that even if the true motivation for being purposeful is intrinsic to serve wider society, ultimately, in many cases, being purposeful will also lead to a company being successful in the long term. And this is something I truly believe is the case for academia, is that if we approach the academic career with a sense of purpose, that can ultimately lead to success in our career. And I'm going to give some concrete examples of this later. So then we apply this, not from companies, but to finance professors. What is a finance professor's purpose? I'm going to share two perspectives from two others in our profession. Uh, I was really lucky to be at Wharton for one year with, with Andrew Metric, and he, in his final talk to students, he was a celebrated teacher as well as researcher. He gave a talk called How to Have a Successful and Meaningful Career, and he said a professor's purpose is the creation and dissemination of knowledge. And then Laurie Hodrick, she was interviewed in a 10 questions interview by the Financial Times. The first question was, what does it mean to be a professor? She said, it's not a title or a job description. It is a way of life. It is being driven by intellectual curiosity to create and translate and disseminate ideas. So pretty much the same definition as Andrew Metric. I'm gonna stick with that today the creation and dissemination of knowledge. Now there's loads of talks out there about finding purpose in your career, be this a lawyer or a doctor or an investment banker. What I wanna do is focus on four unique aspects that I think are specific to our profession and not touch on those other things which you can find in any generic talk about purpose. And these four things are the freedom that we have as finance professors to work on whatever we want to, the non-rivalry that we have in our profession, the tremendous amount of luck and path dependence, and fourth is the potential bandwidth for our contributions. Right, so let me start with the first one, which is freedom. We are really lucky in this profession to be able to choose to work on whatever we want to work on. Now, often we, you hear advice as to, well, how do you go about choosing a research topic? And often the advice that you get is to think about two things. First, is to work on a popular area. So this might be an area that's rapidly growing, maybe a conference is having um, special issues on it and so on, and you see papers being cited and accepted and winning best paper awards. And clearly, 
clearly that is something which is semi-important, but we also know in finance that there is close to efficient markets in many things. So if a topic is indeed really popular, other people will know that it's a popular topic and they're gonna be working on it as well. So just because the topic is popular, that might not be a sufficient reason to work on it. And if I go back to my own PhD, which was 2003 to 2007, what was the really hard topic back then? It was behavioral finance. But then after that period was over, then behavioral finance became much less popular. And so if you choose a topic which is popular at the time, it's not even clear whether it's gonna be popular afterwards. Whereas in the final year of my PhD, I wrote my first paper on corporate social responsibility. That was a completely dead topic 15 years ago. Yet it's my most cited paper now. And so that was something where I had no idea of the popularity. It was just something that was of interest. The second thing people will suggest when you choose why to work on a topic is choose something that you are seeing. For example, um, if you are really good at maths, so, sorry, there's some interference from the FLA room. If you can mute yourself, that'd be great. Um, if, if you are really skilled in finance and in maths, maybe you work on behavioral theory because with these weird utility functions, maybe the standard concavity conditions are not satisfied. It's hard to show an optimum. But again, you're not uniquely skilled. There's loads of really, really skilled people here in the finance profession. So that should not be a necessary or even sufficient condition to work on a topic. So I myself was really lucky 15 years ago to attend the FMA as a PhD student, and I attended the doctoral tutorial in 2006. We were really lucky to hear from some of the leading rights of the profession on how to choose a topic. And that was the advice I was given, choose something that was popular, choose something that is close to your skill set. And there was a professor who said that really prominently. Now the next person who spoke was Jonathan Burke. And if you know Jonathan, this next story will not surprise you. Jonathan just got up and he said, I completely disagree with what the person just said. It doesn't matter whether a topic is popular. It doesn't matter if you're skilled at it. What matters is if you are interested in it. No, he didn't actually say that. He said, what matters is if you are passionate about it. Right, it doesn't matter how well cited this is, this is something that you are probably going to have to de devote five years of your life to it. When you write a paper, right, you are going to have to immerse yourself in that topic, read up on the literature, if it's empirical, get into the weeds of the data and the institutional detail, you're going to present it. And you might be trashed by some discussions, you might get some harsh comments at seminars, you're going to send it to some journals and you're going to be rejected multiple times in many cases. But if you are passionate about the topic that you are studying, then this is something where even though our profession does have some hard knocks, you want to keep going at it and then you might succeed at it. And indeed, what I mentioned earlier was that sometimes the papers that are really cited now were not popular back then. A lot of people had to work hard in order to overcome a lot of hurdles to get this through. And this is why not just being interested in something, but being truly passionate about something is going to be really, really important. And so this is also really important for some of the most difficult things in the profession. So my point three will be on how much luck there is in a profession, like who you just happen to be assigned as your referee, that has a huge effect on the success. But in many of these things, but the most important referee is you. Is this something that you believe was a good use of five years in your life? when you could have researched something else. And loads of us have outside options. You could choose to do many other things than become a finance academic, which are better paid. Is this something that you found intrinsically interesting? And this applies to all people, both pre-tenure and post-tenure. So when I came up for my tenure at Wharton, because it was so long ago, they were still doing things on a paper basis, right? So what you had to do was you had to print out every single paper that you had written, you put them in chronological order and you physically handed them to the administrator who would run the tenure process. And after you do that, you are in massive uncertainty. Like for the next, I think, three or six months, you have no idea how this decision will be. You might be out of a job. You might have to move to a different country. This could be really nerve wracking. But when I handed over that deck, 
to the administrator, I realized that this was the first time in my life I'd held my entire life's work in both hands. And as I looked through the papers, which I put in chronological order, I realized that I didn't write these papers to get tenure. I didn't write them to get approval from some committee. I wrote them because I really cared about those topics. I started with my soccer paper, which was the first thing I ever wrote. Then I went through my job market paper, then some of the CEO papers with Xavier Gebex, and then the CSR papers. I just found these topics to be really interesting. And so I can say with a clear conscience, with full sincerity, when I handed that in, even though there was a ton of uncertainty, I, that uncertainty was significantly reduced because I was really happy with that work that I'd done. And I thought that was the good use of the five years that I had spent at Wharton up to that point. Now, clearly I'm not saying the other extreme, but yeah, it does matter what the decision is and so on. But I think the uncertainty of that decision was significantly reduced by the fact that actually these were things that I had really enjoyed working on and that would have been just as worthwhile had I not got tenure. And then with post tenure, right, you have tons of freedom to work on whatever you want to. And this is indeed why we have the tenure system. And yet there's so much pressure, right, to keep publishing more papers and to advance the academic um, ladder and to keep working in the same areas that we've done because we've built a lot of knowledge there. And so that's the right formula for success. I was just looking at the list of the other people up here who are giving special sessions. You know, say David Yermak, who moved from corporate governance to a completely new area of cryptocurrency. And this is something he was presumably tr truly passionate about to become really successful on it. You have Mike Weisbach, who's now doing things to help uh, younger scholars succeed in the profession. This is something we have tremendous freedom to do, to move into new areas. But probably many people don't think about this because you think, well, I still need to think about what are the things that I'm skilled at? What are the things that I'm popular? And again, I am not suggesting go to the complete opposite extreme. This is not about self-indulgence or blindness about what is relevant. Clearly what you're skilled at and what is being published, that does matter. All I'm doing is just trying to have a pitch for the other side, what you're truly interested in, no matter how often I go to the talks as to choosing research topics, this is something that gets underemphasized. Okay, so the second thing I'm gonna speak about is the non-rivalry aspect of the profession. Well, if you think about other professions, let's say becoming investment banking, going to investment banking, there's massive rivalry there, right? It might be that if you're working on a deal, another investment bank cannot work on a deal. If you acquire a company, then another person cannot acquire, another company can't acquire a company. Yet in our profession, right, we don't have a fixed buy, but this is something that can be grown, it can be expanded. But journal space itself is not finite. It's not that you want somebody else to fail because then there's more space for you. Like new journals can be created. So the RFS was created and then was expanded from once every two months to every month because there were just if sufficient numbers of good papers. At the Review of Finance, we recently increased our publication from five per issue to nine per issue. And so these things here, we are all playing a positive sum game in academics. And what we have here is a huge amount of loyalty, not just to our institution, but to the profession as a whole. So let's think about that, how tenure letters work. How do we decide who do we give tenure to? We look at what our competitors, what people at rival schools say about that candidate. And this is like so standard, we don't think about it, but think about how crazy this might seem to any practitioner. Like, would a law firm decide who gets promoted to law partner based on the evaluations by partners in rival law firms? Absolutely not. But this is what we have here in academia because we have such loyalty to this profession. It is a unique job in that what we're trying to do is to build the profession up more generally. And there's many ways to, to, to practice this. So um, one of them is just to see are the people in our profession as our colleagues in the environment of knowledge. I remember the first WFI I went to in 2007, there was a dinner for just the young assistant professors entering the profession, 
I remember just going to this dinner and meeting people like Armit Saru and Gregor Matfoss and Bruce Carl and thinking, it's cool, we're entering the profession, we're all working on different things, but together we will hopefully advance finance research. And this is something that absolutely can be done, and this is something I know the FMA is clearly committed to. And one way to do this is obviously through conferences, and conferences are great not just to provide feedback on papers, but also to meet other people. But why is it that conferences are nearly the only way to get feedback on papers? Why is it that we need to fly halfway around the world in order to get feedback? Can't we just send papers to each other and provide feedback that way? And suddenly, why is it that the only time that people will give feedback will be in the form of a discussion, which is public, so you get a bit of credit for that, or maybe in a seminar, where you seem smart in front of your colleagues, can we move to a different equilibrium where people are much more willing to provide feedback on each other's papers for free, and that would do so in a much more cost efficient and resource efficient way than flying around the world to, to do this. That's not to say we should stop doing that, but why can't we supplement this with, with something else? And I was really lucky when I started in my career, when I was a, a junior assistant professor, where I got with, there were other more senior and seasoned people, and we just got into an equilibrium where we were providing feedback on each other's papers, and that was something which was really instrumental um, for me. That may well be the case that I might have provided feedback on more papers than I got feedback on, but let's go back to the idea of purpose, which is if you do things for intrinsic reasons, there might be some unexpected instrumental benefit. And so this practice and this habit of providing feedback on others' papers, I do genuinely believe I did this just to help the other papers, but you then yourself learn to think big picture and then to apply the same critiques to your papers. And so you actually develop human capital that way. And this is something you do in refereeing. So I was told when I started out, don't spend too much time on refereeing. It's something that doesn't really help you compared to working on your own research. But I thought, well, if indeed somebody asks me, an editor trusts my opinion on this, I'm going to do a really good job and that's going to advance knowledge. And I had no idea when I started refereeing that the review of financial studies was going to suddenly introduce this referee award. And I believe, I think a couple of the editors who helped introduce that might be in the room right now. And that was some hugely unexpected benefit for something which I think was a truly intrinsic investment of time. But again, this goes to show that many things that you might do to help the profession for intrinsic reasons, that might ultimately lead to some benefits left. And so one of the things that we can do to put this into practice, uh, well, what we've seen right now is that in the pandemic, there are other ways to get feedback and to um, get comments on papers. It could be that people can set up discussion groups for a particular niche field, be it uh, executive compensation. A set of researchers can just provide each other um, to send papers to each other. You can provide feedback by Zoom, perhaps present it to each other in mini seminars. The challenge with conferences is you need scale for a conference to run. And so conferences tend to be on large themes. But if you have, if you're working on a niche field, maybe a growing field, the fact that we can do these things virtually, maybe that's something that we can then start up. Now, my first career was as an investment banker and I was at Morgan Stanley, and that was a case where there was absolutely rivalry, not non-rivalry. Yet, even in such a difficult and competitive profession, what you had was mailing lists where if you had a problem that you wanted to find out, how do I do a waterfall diagram? You send it to the other analysts and associates, and other people would help you. But this is something that doesn't really exist right now in the profession. It's not been at the three schools that, that I've been in, nor is it generally in the profession. What is the data sets that we can use for this? Does anybody know a paper that finds this result? Now we do have this for state list, but can it be that we have something like this for the profession where two minutes of investment from somebody's time can save somebody else two hours? We do have anonymous message boards for really, really bad stuff. And I'm going to describe on the next slide, can we not use this technology for really good stuff, sharing knowledge and the advancement of the profession? 
And another thing would be, well, can we do stuff to disseminate others' research and to give airtime to work that our colleagues in the profession are doing? So as Michelle wrote, I, I write quite a lot of survey papers recently, and then I'll send them out to people in the field just to get comments. And there'll be a couple of people whose comments will always be, cite more of my papers, right? cite these papers and this papers as well. But then the majority of people who write back will say, oh, this is interesting. But by the way, there was this other paper by this other person who has no relation to that. And this is interesting. Maybe this should be part of a survey. And those comments are really, really helpful to disseminate other people's research so that the survey I write will be more informative than it would have been otherwise. Now, the last two slides have been on how the profession should not be seen as something which is rivalrous. We are colleagues in the same profession and can grow the pie of the profession. Yet, unfortunately, there are many circumstances in which we act as if there is huge rivalry, as if it's a zero sum game, that the more we trash somebody else, the better it is for us. And there are ways in which there's, there's trashing of people behind their back, but then there's anonymous trashing of people through message boards. And these things, I think, are the cancer of those of the profession. These are extremely bad. And what this does is just allows for just unvetted accusations and allegations to be made, which can be extremely damaging. And what's really concerning is that this is a profession based on data and evidence. That's the core of what we do. You know, I know of people whose reputation has been tarnished because of some anonymous trashing where things are not even checked. And yeah, I, I know people who admit to me that they read these message boards and they tell me, well, we do this because I want to get information about the profession. But like we can rationalise our decision to do this. But when you think about the word rationalise, this means rational lies. You can always come up with some justification after the fact while you're listening to this information. And you might think, OK, I know that this information might not be correct. But once you read something, you can't unread it. These things are pollution if they are incorrect. And what we're doing by, by visiting these sites is just supporting the advertising revenue which goes on into this. And it might be these things might be non-anonymous. There are lots of cases in which there's schadenfreude, right? So people like it when other people get papers retracted or get papers disproved, or maybe there's a replication crisis and so on. But all of these things are, are bad for the profession. The fact that people are worried about the replicability of papers, that's not just bad for the person who suffered in that case, it is bad for the profession. I know that when I started um, with the review of finance and I said, well, we'll try, we might not succeed, but we'll try to elevate our standards to the top three journals. And then the first year after that, our impact factor was flat. Well, obviously it will be because these things are big lagging indicators. But people were cheering this because they thought, OK, I failed in my attempt. But if that fails, if I fail, then that's bad for the whole profession. It would be good if there were more than top three journals. And so the idea of, well, let's try to show rivalry, often these things might be at our own expense um, instead. One other thing in which we act in terms of huge rivalry is perhaps being territorial about our own agenda. So maybe if I work in ESG, I want to be seen as the only expert in ESG and bash other people's work in ESG. Right. But if we do that, then who is going to be the people whose research is going to succeed? It's going to be from McKinsey. It's going to be from the consultancies. It's not going to be from academia, right? Because the less, the less we promote and disseminate the research from our colleagues in this academic profession, the more it is that the research which will get more airtime is the research which is not rigorous research, which is done to market a company rather than a scientific investigation of the data. So I believe our profession is, is under attack, right? Research is now seen as irrelevant, right? We get into little fights with each other and people say, well, academics is irrelevant because people can't agree. And obviously there are reasons why people should genuinely disagree. People might use different methodologies and get different answers, and that is fine. But sometimes the rivalry that we see is not based on that. It's the unwillingness to acknowledge or promote other people's work when we are all in the same profession. And the future is if indeed our research is seen as irrelevant, more weight gets put on the McKinsey studies. Maybe we're going to be reduced more towards teaching schools. There are now teaching schools popping up. 
are people going to be willing to fund research as they did in the past? I think what we can do as a profession is to disseminate and share each other's research to show the power of academic research to solve these big social problems. And this is even more powerful and more rigorous and more careful and more reliable than research by even big names like the McKinsey's or the World Economic Forums. I'm sorry if this analogy same sounds a little bit corny, but a lion can't catch a springbok in a race. The springbok is faster. So what does the lion do? The lion watches and waits for the springboks to start fighting with each other. And then once they start fighting with each other, then the lion can catch the springboks. And so this is something that I feel can happen to our profession if indeed we act in this way with rivalry rather than viewing each other as, as colleagues. Another very corny analogy is to be the thermostat, not the thermometer, right? A thermometer is something that reflects the temperature of what's around you. A thermostat is something that affects the temperature. And yes, there are difficult elements to the profession, but we've got a lot of power, um, whoever we are, to, to try to change that. So I've seen cases in which people have received really harsh discussions at conferences, and that person has gave a harsh discussion not to be constructive, but to be seen as sort of the bully to get a lot of points. And then I've seen other people just step in in the queue and say, well, actually, that comment was unfair because of these reasons. And those small things to make a huge difference. What do I mean by this final line, give gifts of unequal value? Right, what we learn in finance is that things of equal value trade, right? A put called parity that can replicate an, an stock option. So a, a, a great, great plain option. Yet, actually, some of the best ways in which we can show citizenship are things that are of unequal value. So things that cost us a little, but have a huge effect on the recipient. So I mean, this is my days as a PhD student. So it would be that there will be faculty who would just spend a couple of minutes to talk to me at a conference, and that makes a huge difference. Right, the NBER is one of the most competitive places not so much in the conference itself, but when you have a meal, right? What people do is they wait for the big senior people to sit down and they rush to make sure that they sit next to them. And I was really lucky to go to the NBR as a PhD student just because Lucian Bedchuk knew my work on executive pay and organised it one year. And I sat down and there was an assistant professor who sat next to me and she should have been talking to everybody else on that table. Well, I was just a PhD student, yet she didn't. She just started talking to me. She was like genuinely really interested in my research. And this was Wei Jiang, who was the keynote speaker a couple of years ago and then became my co-author on a couple of papers. And clearly when she started talking to me, she had no idea that we had the same research interests and we'd co-author later, but did this genuinely just to give a gift of an equal value to a PhD student who knew nobody else at that table and was really happy to have somebody else interested in their research. So the next topic I'm going to highlight is luck and path dependency, right? So in our profession, there is probably even more luck than there might be in other professions. So people say in baseball, but well, you need to have a thick skin because uh, even if you're a great batter, you're going to hit the ball 30% of the time. Yet in our profession, right, the top journals, they accept papers 5% of the time. So there's a massive failure rate. And because successes are so few, like one success, one lucky outcome can lead to a huge effect for you and a huge amount of success, even if it was down to luck. Right. And even, indeed, successes are partly down to luck. So Evo Welsh, his, his paper, found that the referee specific component is twice the common component when you're assessing a paper. So actually, whether you get a paper in or not, that might depend more on the referee selection rather than the intrinsic merits of a paper. And then when you combine luck with path dependency, then luck has an even more of a role. So some of you might know this really nice working paper by Rogard et al, which finds that once you are lucky, once you've had some success, once you're famous, your future papers are likely to be cited more. So all of what that means is that there can be people who are in privileged positions who got there partly down to luck. And, and one of these people, is actually myself. So I am this position because of luck, right? At MIT, um, you do a PhD course in empirical asset pricing. And there was the same professor who taught it every single year. 
But this year he was on sabbatical. And so there was a visiting professor who taught it, who was Tim Johnson, who was at LBS at the time. And the very first week he talked about the papers on mood and asset promises. That's not a common topic in empirical finance PhD classes, but he talked about, he talked about it. And he taught the Hirsch Life and Shumway paper on stock, on sunshine and um, the, the stock returns. And then this gave me, this gave me the idea of my soccer paper. I just scribbled it into the margin of, of, of the paper and started working on it. And that would have never happened had it not been that an unusual topic, mood in the stock market, happened to be taught in my PhD class. And then after you come up with a paper, what is the worst thing that can happen if you've written a paper? Well, the worst thing that can happen is that other people are writing the same paper. And this happened for my paper. So Diego Garcia and Ivan Norley at Dartmouth College were writing exactly the same paper. And yeah, that was the worst thing, but it ended up being the best thing because what they did is they offered me co-authorship. They could have done a straight fight. They would have won. I was a PhD student in my second year. I hadn't even done my qualifying exams. I had no idea about how to submit a paper, how to respond to, respond to referees. They co-authored with me. And through that, they taught me a huge amount about how to respond to a referee, how to write a paper, and all of those things. And then after that paper was published in 2006, the year before I was on the market, the AFA just happened to be in Boston. And because I was at MIT, I could go along. And I saw Cliff Holderness presenting his paper showing how block holders are prevalent, but they're really small. I thought, well, all of these theory papers I read, they suggest block holders, they add value through intervening in a company through voice. But if block holders are too small, how can they do this? And that's what gave me the idea to write a paper on governance through exit. Again, pure luck that I was lucky to have the AFA in Boston, the city I was in at that time. Right, so if I were to play this game a hundred times with the same initial conditions, 99 out of those times, I would not have the privilege of giving this keynote address today. I'm here because this is the one out of 100 that the things happen to be in our favor. Now, don't get me wrong, like clearly you have to do something with the luck and people who have been successful have worked hard at these things, but there is more luck in our profession than what we think. Now, why does that matter? So what are the implications? First is those in good positions have benefited in some degree not entirely, but in some degree, have benefited from luck. And I truly believe it is our responsibility then to engage in citizenship, some of the things I mentioned in the last section, to pay this back. And indeed, you see this with the other people doing the special sessions at this conference. But on the flip side, those in different positions might be as good as you or better than you, but encountered bad luck. Right, and if you just had one bad luck, they, these things can be persistent. So for those of you in the physical conference, what does your badge say? That has your name on it, but it also will probably say your institution. And so why is your institution like so relevant? Well, every conference I'm at, it says your name and your institution. And like sort of the only reason that it's relevant is that it allows people to judge whether you're a good researcher or not. That is why people look at the institution. But that's crazy, because if indeed there is quite a lot of luck, there will be some great researchers at perhaps lower ranked schools than people who are at higher ranked schools. Now, at other conferences, in practitioner world, you do have the name of the institution. And that name of an institution is useful. It is relevant. Why? You might go to a practitioner finance conference. Some people have on their nameplate Morgan Stanley. And you think, oh, that's interesting. They're investment banking. Other people might have Fidelity. Well, they're in asset management. Other people might be an insurance company. And so the name of the institution matters because people do different jobs and therefore you might want to find people who have some synergies. But here, we all do the same job. Like we're all in research and teaching. Why is it that we have to have the name of the institution? Why not have our research interests? Why doesn't it say corporate governance or macro finance or behavioral asset pricing or something like that? Would that not lead to better interactions as conferences rather than just stating um, the name of your institution? And then if you're at the AFA, it's even worse, right? If you're a student, it says student on your nameplate. Why do they have that? Is this to say, I'm a student, don't waste time talking to me? 
I just wonder why, why this has to be the case. At the NBER, when you're there, you start every NBER meeting by saying your name and saying your institution. Why is your institution relevant? Unless if you happen to be new to the NBR that year, people can judge you based on your institution thinking, well, do you actually deserve to be there? And so all of this, why is the institution less relevant is that we all do the same things. Regardless of what institution we're at, we all have a seat at the table. Well, if you're in investment banking, you are not in the room. If you're not at Goldman Sachs, you are not working on that deal, and therefore you can have no input into it. But here, anybody and any institution can submit to a journal. Anybody can go to any conference and go to any session, aside from a few selective ones like the NBER. We are all in the same game. So really, the institution doesn't make a difference unless you do make it a difference in that if I, as an editor, am biased towards people of different institutions, or we choose to interact with people based on the institution that we're at. I remember when I was on the job market and the job market is like really, um, really uh, nerve wracking because you've, your type is revealed at the end of the job market. You learn your theta based on the institution that you get a job at. And so this is nerve wracking because you wonder, was my last five or 10 for five or six years or four years worth it? And I was chatting to Demetrius Papanikolaou who was graduating in the same year as me and he said, Alex, chill out. But why does the institution matter? All it matters for is pride. But we do the same job. We do research. We do teaching. Everywhere that we're doing this. Yes, there are some differences. Again, I'm not going to the other extreme. Clearly, you, you might want to be in an institution with better colleagues and better students. But even that goes down nowadays. What we now have. Um, seminars that anyone can attend. Minnesota is running a series of corporate finance seminars that anybody can attend. So if our true purpose is the creation and dissemination of knowledge, your institution makes less difference. Obviously, that's not to say, OK, we shouldn't try as job market candidates to try and get the best job. But if you might not get the outcome that you hope for or the tenure outcome that you hope for, actually a purpose driven approach to these things might actually say it suggests that the institution matters less than we think. And the final thing I'm going to talk about is bandwidth. I saw when I was at Warren Morgan Stanley, I spent seven year, months of my life working on one company's problems. I was working on a merger and acquisition deal. And then once it completed, it was in the Financial Times the next day. It felt fantastic. And then the day after that, the news was something else. And I realized I'd worked, I spent seven months of my life working at one company's problem at that one time. Whereas as a professor, we have massive bandwidth, right? The research that we do can be timeless. What we teach our students that can stay with them and they can teach them to this to other people. And yeah, this is the case for perhaps every professor, but in finance, our research and teaching, I think matters even more. And I hope I'm not being disparaging to people to teach other subjects, but what we are teaching in finance, this has implications for how companies are run, for how people save and invest for the future, how people make financial decisions. And so what we do, we've got tremendous potential to have huge social impact with the bandwidth of what we are doing. But let me change the slide. Why right? our research and teaching has the potential to really matter, but it doesn't because of how we've chosen to run our profession. Right, so teaching has zero or negative effect on professional success. I remember my first day at Wharton, we all met the deputy dean for an induction. I asked him, what is the weight that you put on teaching in tenure decisions? He answered zero. And before I could get upset with that, he clarified, he said zero or negative. Why? Because if you spend too much time in teaching, people will think that you're not serious about research. But how sad is that comment? How disappointing is this comment for a profession if your mission is the creation and dissemination of knowledge? Clearly, research is absolutely important. You can't teach stuff unless you've got the rigorous research. But if the weight of teaching is zero or negative, then why are we doing this research to begin with? Right? Who are the people who are paying our salary? Why do we not care about them? I just saw, um, I think it was yesterday, I got the um, ballots for the European Finance Association directors. 
What this says is it talks about, well, who should you elect based on their research? Nothing is in here about teaching, right? So it doesn't just enter the tenure decision, even post-tenure, these are things with little reward. Also, the impact that we have on media and practice has little effect, or maybe even negative effect, right? It might be that people think that if you are doing stuff which could be understood in the real world, then it must be dumbed down, it mustn't be pure. And similarly, relevance is something that we don't really take into account. Now again, clearly, I don't want to advocate going to the other opposite extreme. There is some research, which is basic, fundamental research, which has huge academic merit, even if it's not immediately relevant. Some of my most recent research has been on the informativeness principle. But why is it that we are putting a, a close to zero weight on the bandwidth of our contributions on how much impact that we're having on wider society, this giving the students that we teach, the companies and the policies that get published. So the, if the impact factor of the Journal of Finance is 7.5, and that is the most cited journal in our profession. How many students do we teach each year? 200, 300, maybe more, right? And so that's not to say that research is not important, but this shows that us that teaching is really, really important. Our base papers, if we get them into the top journal, will be cited seven and a half times every year if we've got the mean paper. Yet we're teaching 200 new minds every year. And then when they go on to become in their organizations, they will then start to pass on things to other people. And so what we're doing is if our purpose is the creation and the dissemination of knowledge, this thing really, really, really matters. And so for teaching, what does this involve? Not just obviously putting emphasis into teaching, but how can we teach research? Can we teach not just our research, but the research of the profession? And to show people that there is actually a huge amount of contribution from academic research that goes beyond what you get from consultancies and goes beyond simple introspection. So this is why I've joined the Principles of Corporate Finance book, right? The economics of writing textbooks in 2021 is really, really poor, but it is a privilege to join this great book and to try to put as much research of this profession into this as possible to ensure that what we are teaching students is based on large-scale academic research and a lot of rigor. In terms of media and practice, Right, so there are various policies being um, proposed throughout the world. A lot of it tries to suggest stakeholder capitalism. Let's move away from profits and let's try to restrict share buybacks and restrict dividends. And all of this is shooting from the hip. It's not actually based on evidence or logic. Now it takes effort to write into an SEC consultation or in the UK, a Financial Reporting Council con con um, consultation. But are these things, for people perhaps who have tenure, who have the time to do this, things that we can contribute to, right? Because if we don't, what is going to influence it? It's going to be poor research and this can change law. We can have different laws where we're going to have things which are going to be bad for the economy, bad for the finance profession more generally, are these things that we can speak out about. And also just relevance, is this something that really, really matters? It makes our job fun. Yes, uh, the publication process is difficult, you get rejections, but it makes it interesting. And it elevates our profession more generally. And when it Shaw's keynote at the WFA last year said that if we are going to be seen as irrelevant, that's just going to be shrinking the profession more generally. Why is it not that we're going to try to put a greater emphasis on relevance in what we do and in what we evaluate? And so that's going to be my final slide before the conclusion is that many people here will be people in authority. They'll be senior, tenured people. Can we just slightly change how we uh, evaluate our faculty? Well, obviously research is the most important thing. Hopefully I've emphasized this throughout and rigor of that research, but can we put a bit more weight on teaching, on real world impact, relevant and on relevance? Can the FMA, which already is putting a lot of emphasis on things like this, can we do more? Can other associations like the AFA, and the EFA put more emphasis on these other things to grow the bandwidth of the profession and make us even more relevant. And finally, those not in authority, you can still pursue these things for intrinsic reasons, right? There's a lot of uncertainty in terms of professional success. It comes down to luck and a lot of other things, but 
if you're working on all of these things because you care about it, then that attenuates the uncertainty. So I remember when I was in my fourth year review at Wharton, at that time I had nine A publications, and yet I was told at the end of the review that the chance of me getting tenure was significantly less than 50%. It could be even zero at that point. And I was quite crushed by that news. And it just so happened that a student walked into my office because he wanted some help with some finance um, issue. And I, he, I was just visibly so upset and I told him what happened. And he said, well, look at all of your teaching awards. And I said, they don't matter at all, I'm gonna be fired. And he said, no, each award here represents 200 students. So those five awards represent 1000 students. And so again, when you think about sort of all these other things, right, there's certain things in the profession we don't have control on, which is whether our paper gets accepted or not, or whether we get tenure, but what do we have control on? What topic we work on, right? Is this something we're passionate about? Is it relevant? We can choose to put emphasis on teaching and some of these other dimensions, and hopefully that can complement the most important part of our job, which is research, but also one of the most uncertain parts. Okay, so in summary, I think this is a fantastic profession to be part of. We are truly privileged to be part of this profession. We have the freedom to work on whatever we want to, but sometimes we feel we don't actually have that freedom because we have to work on what's popular or what we're good at. We have tremendous power to be citizens to this profession and our loyalty is to the profession, not to our institution. But some of the things that we do will be trying to focus on rivalry, how we can sort of bring other people down. The institution that we're working on or that we're working at might not really be relevant, yet we judge other people by their institution. And this means that ourselves, our job market outcome, we make this much more nerve wracking than it actually is. And finally, we have huge potential to make massive bandwidths of contributions to wider society, but the way in which we evaluate things often doesn't fully um, leverage that. Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to do this. It's, uh, it's great to have this to be able to talk about something I would never be able to do in a standard um, conference talk. So I uh, hope this is of, of value to some people and we we'll look forward to the questions and chat.